Hi, everybody. Um, we have a QC uh, information quality cluster, and we would like to welcome you to this session. As people are trickling, if you could go to the session notes and put your name and your information in there, we appreciate it. Um, I'd like to remind everybody about the community participation guideline reminders and we will go to uh, provide a little information about um, IQC. So IQC um, has been focusing on the data and information quality related issues and challenges. And we bring people together to um, through the monthly telecoms. And we have invited speakers from IQC members uh, or by international domain experts. And then the, um, we're trying to um, provide and communicate uh, the community about the standards and the best practices. Um, for that, we collaborating with other international and national organizations. The last part we do is to build framework to make it easier for um, stakeholders to learn and work deal with uh, addressing the data quality issues. And now we have done a number of the um, uh, work. Uh, one is to associate with the different aspect of data quality and information quality through the data site life cycle. And we also worked on the data uncertainty issues. And the latest work that Cluster has been uh, focusing on is to commute and capture the uh, data set quality information through the whole life cycle so, um, data set life cycle and building on that and that leads to today's session and we're going to focus on the quality of findability accessibility in uh, operability and reusability and see how the uh, capability of repositories and approaches that has been used in the community to help the um, stakeholders, uh, data stakeholders to ensure the fair. So we have excellent uh, lineup of presentations and without further ado, and we are going to start the presentation and the goal of session, I have a list there and I'm not going to go through. And as I mentioned, um, we're going to have six invited presentation. After that, we have a QA info and discussion. And then with the closing um, uh, remark by our chair, uh, Zhong Liu, and uh, welcome. And David is going to facilitate the presentation. Yes. Hello, so uh, my name is David Moroni, so I am also uh, the co-chair of this session and of the Information Quality Cluster. I just wanna remind everybody too, as we have the notes page pulled up here, uh, please take a moment to uh, fill out your name and your affiliation so we can capture your participation um, during this, uh, this session. And also uh, the, notes, the notes document is meant to be collaborative. So if you, if you wanna capture any uh, key points or even a question that you may have, uh, for both if you're on the call or in the room, uh, that'll be a really great capture point. And we, if you do have a question you want to jot down in the notes that we can address later on in the Q&A, it'd be really helpful if you could also put your name there so we know who's asking the question and we know how, who to properly address the answer to that question. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Yes. So I believe there is a link to the notes from the key code chat. So if you, yes, so, and we do have uh, Zhang Lu and we have Peng uh, also on the line uh, on Zoom and also on Kiko chat. So if you do have an issue accessing the notes, uh, please feel free to post that comment there and we can direct you if, if you're having any difficulty with that. Okay, so our first speaker is Dr. Bob Downs, who's uh, also one of our ESIP Information Quality Cluster co-chairs. He's also a senior digital archivist and acting head of cyber infrastructure and informatics research and development of at CSEN, the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, a research and data center for, uh, of the 
Earth Institute of Columbia University in New York. So Bob uh, is on the, on the line, Bob. Hopefully you can hear me okay and feel free to take it away. Oh, great. Uh, uh, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh yes, I'm gonna go ahead and load your slides real quick. Oh, okay. And hopefully, uh, I think I might, I might have to enable some sharing of that in a minute here. Did you want to try to? Okay, sorry. Oh, great. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to be talking about comparing the FAIR data quality information, uh, data quality information guidelines to related principles. Uh, next slide, please. And just as a quick summary of the principles, there are five of them. The first one is to describe the data set where we would have a, a title, a persistent ID. So it has a comprehensive landing page with the version and all that kind of information. Uh, the next is to utilize a structured quality assessment model. And this could be in the form of a metric or a matrix. And then the next one, the third one is to capture the quality attributes the, in terms of its aspects or its dimensions or the assessment method and the results in a data set level metadata record using a consistent framework or schema for your metadata. And then uh, the fourth one is to describe comprehensively the assessment method, the workflow, and the results in at least a human readable quality report. And then the last one, the fifth one, is to report and disseminate the data set quality information in an organized way through a web interface uh, with a comprehensive description. And so uh, next slide, please. Well, thanks. Uh, so you might ask, well, why should we map the FAIR DQI guidelines to principles? And uh, basically the uh, principles represent a community effort that is communities work together, they achieve consensus on particular issues and uh, they adopt principles to inform practice and to share that information with other people. Uh, when we map the principles uh, uh, to the guidelines, uh, what we're doing is we're identifying relationships that can be used to determine how to satisfy the principles. So in effect, if we're implementing a particular guideline, we also could be meeting or addressing a particular principle. And then uh, these, uh, by identifying these relationships, we can also guide our practice. We can, uh, for instance, if there's some costs associated with adoption efforts, we can justify those uh, costs and the efforts taking place to uh, take uh, uh, care of such adoption. And then we can also establish priorities for implementing different aspects of our uh, uh, cyber infrastructure. The next slide, please. So the principles that are being mapped to the FAIR DQI guidelines are the FAIR principles and the geodata management and the geodata sharing principles. And I'll just go over those briefly. Uh, the FAIR principles are to be find, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, next slide. And uh, when we talk about that in terms of data set quality information, we're saying, is the data set quality information discoverable, for example? Or is uh, that data set quality information sufficiently described uh, so that that information is accessible. Uh, also, we could say in terms of interoperability, is the data set quality information understandable? And for reuse, uh, are the rights described for using the data set quality information? Next slide, please. So 
Uh, this is the mapping that was done by Peng et al. Uh, in uh, their article that was uh, came out uh, last March, I believe, uh, in the Data Science Journal. In fact, uh, we were just notified uh, that this was one of the highest uh, read uh, articles uh, in the Data Science Journal recently. So that was really uh, impressive to uh, read that. Um, and here uh, from that article, what we've done is we've uh, mapped uh, the guidelines, each of these five guidelines to the FAIR principles. And you can see uh, in some cases there are direct mappings, uh, for instance, between guideline one and findable. Uh, for instance, and that one is labeled with a persistent identifier. But we can also see there are some dotted uh, lines in here. And so those uh, dash lines, uh, they're basically inferred and they may or may not be true, but uh, we're expecting them to be true sometimes. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Uh, next slide, please. So the geodata management principles, uh, there are really five categories of them. Uh, discovery, a, a theme we constantly hear, accessibility, usability, preservation, and curation. And under discoverability, uh, there's really uh, just one the metadata. And under accessibility, there's uh, uh, just one, which is uh, online access. But you'll see under usability, there are four, data encoding, uh, traceability, documentation, and quality control our topic of today. And then uh, under preservation, there are two principles, uh, uh, data preservation and data and metadata verification. And lastly, under curation, there are two, data review and reprocessing and persistent and resolvable identifier. So if we look at the next slide, please, we can see that uh, here is a mapping between uh, these and uh, for instance, uh, similar to the, uh, uh, the FAIR guidelines, there's a direct mapping between the FAIR DQI guidelines and metadata. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's an obvious one. But uh, there's also a direct mapping between uh, that uh, guideline, uh, uh, FAIR DQI guideline one, describing the data set and persistent and resolvable identifiers, which is number 10 uh, um, uh, for the geodata management principle. So um, we can see that they're mapped a little bit differently. And it uh, just reflects the fact that these were uh, all uh, developed independently of each other. Um, uh, uh, these guidelines for uh, geo data management principles, they came out uh, right around the same time as the FAIR principles. Uh, moving along, uh, next slide, please. Um, we can look at the geo data sharing principles. And uh, quite simply, we can say that there are three and they are simply open, by def open data by default. Um, and with minimal restrictions on use and at no more cost than the cost of reproduction and distribution, and then with minimal time delay. So they're quite simple and there are only three of them. And moving along, uh, here is the mapping of these. And uh, you can see the guideline one is mapping uh, uh, directly to uh, uh, data sharing principle one, but there's also a dotted line uh, b between uh, the FAIR DQI guideline five and data sharing principle one. And that goes to the, uh, another point I'd like to uh, raise. We could go on to the next slide. Um, and that is uh, when we see these dotted lines, they uh, can really imply some weak mappings uh, that perhaps need to be explored further. Uh, and this might be an opportunity for us 
uh, that is the uh, uh, data quality or information quality cluster. One minute left, Bob. Well, thank you. So the opportunity for us as the information quality cluster to uh, look at how we might be able to enhance the scope of the fair D, uh, DQI guidelines. And also uh, it can identify opportunities to strengthen the language. That is the, the descriptions of the guidelines that are being used. Maybe that could be improved as well. And so with that, uh, I wanna thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Yeah, so it should be sharing now. Okay. All right. So our next talk is by Mark Bushnell. This is actually going to be a pre recorded talk. I believe Mark uh, said, stated that uh, he would be on the call in case uh, there's questions during the QA. Uh, but just because um, of some complexities with logistics on Mark's end, we, uh, he decided to make this a uh, pre recorded presentation. So Mark Bushnell is a um, uh, is basically from NOAA and a consultant with IUS, which is the Integrated Ocean Observing System. And so without further ado, we're going to play this. Hopefully this works okay. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Bushnell and until recently I was the National Coordinator for the IUS Cortai project. And I wanna say at the outset that uh, I didn't choose the title of this talk. I had something else in mind. But uh, thought about it, and uh, I realized that if I addressed the suggested topic, I was guaranteed the attention of at least one individual. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized it was a good topic. Uh, because well, synergy is a common buzzword. When accomplished, it, it really is amazing. Uh, collaboration and communication are key, and that's why I'm glad to speak to you today. So I'll give a quick overview of IUS and talk about the Quartad project, the newly expanded scope of that project, and some implementation considerations. So I use by the numbers. I think most think of I use as a NOAA program, but it's really a collective effort of 17 federal partners. It's administered by the National Ocean Service. We see there are 11 regional associations. More on that next and 13 quartile manuals. So here are the 11 regional associations. All are certified as regional coastal observing systems. And among many things that provides liability protections similar to federal agencies uh, enjoy. Different regions have different requirements, different stakeholders, and some freedom to tailor products is appreciated by these RAs. If you go to this website here, uh, you can find some of the standards and resources that are provided to the regional associations and others. Uh, there are one or more links for each item listed here. And as a first example of synergy, we see that the ESIP Marine Data Cluster Vocabulary Guidance is, is listed at, at the bottom. So on to the court side. Uh, there are 13 manuals, as I mentioned, and they just, each describes a suite of QC tests that can be applied to the very specific variable. Uh, also shown is the uh, glider implementation manual. That's uh, implementation of temperature and salinity quality control for the IUS glider DAC. And then uh, down here is the Quartai project plan update for the next five years that was just issued in May. So in order to create a traditional quartile manual, uh, uh, interoperable data stream, data usage in real time, and an engaged community are required. Uh, there are 34 core variables identified by IUS, and many in fact don't have real time applications or they don't have interoperable data streams. Uh, and so as we prepare this 
five year plan update, we wondered, what are we going to do? There's no obvious core variables that are ready for a core time manual. So we went back to the seven laws of core time that were coined in the very first meeting in 2003. And the existing manuals address these first three laws nicely, but there's four other laws that core time could be addressing. And so we're planning to expand the scope of core time to include these additional laws. So as we wrote the five year plan, we agreed that we would carry on these core activities, one of which includes presentations like this one today. This last one, work with manufacturers to embed QC tests. It's an important element as we embrace the internet of things. For example, DARPA's Oceans of Things program envisions thousands of small low cost instruments that form a distributed sensor network. And it's entirely possible that the quality control of those observations could be done by those instruments themselves. Now under the expanded scope, core time goes from QC of real time data to the QAQC of timely data. Now, what does that mean? Usually there's five time scales associated with the potential for quality control. Traditionally, we've done the real time, which is operating on the most recent data point. You don't have the next data point to help. And then there's real time, which all we know is it's, I'm sorry, and there's near real time. We know it's not real time, but it's faster than the third scale, which is delayed mode. Delayed mode might be after, well, it might be monthly or biweekly quality control on data streams. The fourth one is post-process, where you might wait until an instrument's recovered and do a post calibration. And then the fifth step is reanalysis, which is usually done on decadal scales and involves quality control of many variables all at once. As an example of an expanded core type topic, the QA of HF radar service current mapping antenna patterns. Each installation has an antenna that has an associated antenna pattern. You can use the idealized pattern, or you can measure the actual pattern and improve the quality of the surface current measurements. But there's many ways to measure these antenna patterns, and the resulting patterns are not uniformly applied. So this is an example where a community is ready for a standard to be developed. So in the five-year plan, we listed these five potential expanded topics. Uncertainty quantification, rigorous uncertainty quantification is rarely done and almost desperately needed across the board. Seascape Climatologies is a NOAA Coast Watch product that provides pelagic habitat classification. And then the vessel AIS data QC. AIS positions are widely used, and we've had a suggestion that quality control of those data would be helpful. Another change that we're making to Core Todd is that the onus to create a manual is shifting to the community. In the past, the National Coordinator, together with the Core Todd Board of Advisors and IOS, would choose a variable and then go about creating it with the assistance of the community members. But the remaining core variables are complex, and we're going to need the subject matter experts associated with that particular field to step up and say, yeah, it's time to create some QA QC documentation. Core Todd and IOS are ready to help, but the onus is on the community itself. So this is a potential synergy between IOS Core Todd, 
community and ESIP that we might work on together. Here are other uh, potential synergy links. If you go to these links, you'll find Quartan-inspired standards and, and recommendations. And if ESIP finds them useful and, and applies them or agrees to them, then we've achieved synergy. So we can work on these things ourselves or we can all work together. Synergy is better. Uh, I hope I've inspired some collaboration and communication thoughts. Let's work together. Thank you. Okay, this is also going to be a remote presentation by Rama Priyan, who also prefers to go by Rama. And so Rama is a uh, has basically reinvigorated this cluster uh, many years ago. I guess I guess it was back in 2017, 2018 or so, and was the chair of the cluster at that time when I was co-chair as well. Um, and, and so Rama is actually still an active collaborator. We're very fortunate to have Rama presenting on the fairness assessment of NASA's Earth Observation Science Data and Information Systems at EOS DIS. So without further ado, um, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to advance that slide. Uh, Rama, hopefully uh, you are able to hear me okay, and please feel free to take it away. Yes, are you able to hear me? <clears throat> yes, we hear you. Okay, great. Um, well, actually it was 2015 that we reinvigorated uh, IQC, and uh, yeah, I was the chair until January 2020, and it was then taken over by uh, Yashin Wei, who continues to be co-chair now, now that we have a new chair for the IQC, Zhang, Zhang Liu. Okay, anyway, uh, some of the material that I'm presenting today uh, came from the AGU fall meeting presentation that uh, myself and Jeannie Benke had uh, in 2020, December. And uh, the assessment that we did uh, is thanks to Chris Linus and uh, Dax. They contributed to the fair assessment of uh, EOSDIS. And my work is supported by NASA's contract with uh, Science Systems and Applications Incorporated. So much for the acknowledgements. Let me go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. So <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have uh, are not familiar in the audience about NASA's EOS DIS. So I'm gonna say a few words about it, be very quick about it because probably most of you know about it. And say a few words about why we want to do self, why we wanted to do self-assessment and talk about how we did it and give you a summary of results. More detailed presentation of uh, this is, it's, it was a recorded presentation. It's a 15 minute presentation at the December 16, 2020 meeting, I think I posted a link, a link to that in this presentation itself. Uh, so it's a recorded presentation that's uh, on Figshare and available. So next slide. So what is EOS DIS? The Earth Observing System Data and Information System is uh, a system that uh, manages most of uh, NASA's Earth science data. And data, there are many sources, uh, aircraft, uh, in uh, field, in field, and uh, oops, go back for Sorry, a second. Sorry, that was a mistake. I apologize. Okay. Um, so, um, and we have satellite data, of course, a lot of satellite data, and we have a whole variety of data, and they get processed and uh, uh, archived and distributed to the community of uh, large community of users. And uh, we have had billions of files go out to millions of users every year worldwide. 
So that's a good point to change to this slide. Oh, go ahead. Go to the yeah, next sorry, Rama, for some reason, it, it keeps advancing by itself. I'll try to control that though. Oh, okay, probably it's timed or something, I don't know. Um, in any case, um, so we have data for the entire um, Earth system of multiple disciplines, multiple places. So atmospheric, oceanic, oceanographic, cryospheric, land, and human dimensions. And all these data are managed by 12 different DACs. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> 12 different DACs that are uh, distributed uh, around the United States. And they are based on disciplines as indicated in this diagram. I don't really want to spend a lot of time on this because a lot of you are familiar with it. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, and EOS DIS has been operating and evolving since 1994. This is a somewhat, somewhat of a detailed chart that we have used in some meetings in the past to emphasize how EOS DIS has evolved over time. But the main point of this is that it has grown over time, both in technical capability, in terms of volumes that are volumes and number of users served, number of volumes of data handled, number of users served and so on and the technical capabilities themselves. So the evolution is based on not just the um, uh, change in technology that's available in the world, but also a change in expectations by the user community because of those technologies. So we have a lot of uh, constant user feedback that is incorporated into the improvements that are made into the system. Uh, the EOS disk became operational in 1994 uh, and FAIR came into being in 2012-ish. So it's about, by two decades, we have, uh, we've been around for two decades before FAIR became a popular term. So let's go on to the next slide. Next, okay. So it preceded FAIR principles definition and popularization by two decades. And uh, part of the overall, strat overall evolution strategy is to ensure that we keep up with current technology and community needs, as I just mentioned. And we need to be obtaining and be receptive to user feedback. And uh, another example of uh, how we are keeping up is membership in the World Data System and Core, core Trust Seal certification of all the DACs. So we are keeping up with what's happening in the world. Uh, and we recognize the importance of uh, fair principles. So did a self-assessment in 2019, 2020. We wanted to figure out how, well, fair is becoming very popular. So let's see how we are doing with respect to fair is even though we have existed much before fair. So um, that's what it did, we did. And uh, more recently, we have had um, a document called SB, SPD41A, SMD policy document. SMD stands for Science Mission Directorate of NASA. So that document is in draft that came out in November, November 8, 2021. So that implies a need for ongoing assessment and improvement actions. So from all those points of view, a self-assessment is a good thing to do. Let's move on. <clears throat> so the method we used was uh, Look at the different FAIR principles that are numbered F1, F2, et cetera, through R1.3. So each of these is divided into sub principles. That's why you see this thing called R1.3. I believe there's a total of 19 or so. I, I, I've lost count of that. But anyway, we looked at all the principles, created a spreadsheet that listed all those principles. And um, I took a look at it from the point of view of uh, human actionability. And Chris Linus took a look at it from the point of view of uh, machine actionability for the SDIS, SDIS project and EOS DIS as a whole. And we asked each of the 12 DACs to take a look at them from the point of view of their own DACs, as well as make comments about the overall uh, EOS DIS. Uh, so, so we looked at it from both the human actionability and machine actionability point of view, and we compared uh, <coughs> our uh, uh, mine and uh, Chris Linus's evaluations 
with the comments that we got from the DAX. And the, there is a spreadsheet that we have maintained that includes all the comments as well as our uh, quote unquote rankings. Rankings of course were very subjective because there was no objective method of uh, evaluating at the time. Um, I looked at some literature that was published and there was, there was nothing really available that we could use. This is two years ago. So, um, uh, so uh, move on to the next slide. This just gives you the summary. The details are all available in the other presentation that I referred to. So I didn't really want to bring it here because this is a shorter presentation. And uh, so basically we ranked each of the, for each of the 19 criteria, we had ranking uh, starting from one for the least and uh, 10 for the most compliant. And so we ranked findability uh, we need more work. We have identified what actions we have taken or what, what actions we had taken that made us rank these that way. And so there, there is, there's more, more work that needs to be done. So um, uh, there is findability, accessibility, we did uh, better. One minute left. He's doing well. Yeah, almost done. Okay. Um, and reusability is, uh, we've done very well in the human actionability, machine actionability. In all cases, machine actionability needs more work from, from us to improve. So let's move on to the next slide. So to conclude, uh, EOSDIS robustly supports FAIR principles in general, works very well with human interfaces. Machine actionability is improving, but needs more work. And I should add that uh, the NASA has Earth System, Earth Science Data System Working Groups or ESDSWGs. There is a new working group that has been started led by Peng and uh, Bob Downs. And uh, it's, the group is titled Making NASA SMD Funded Science, Earth Science Data Fair. And we gave it a cute name because it's open and fair. So it's OFAIR, OFAIR Working Group. So the purpose of that working group is to synthesize community fair practices and provide principle by principle guidance on how to apply the principles to ensure and enable uh, our data to be open and free, uh, to, to enable the data that are already open and free to become also fair in the fullest sense. That's it. Thank you all. So while we transition to our next speaker, who is uh, Tamar Norkin at USGS, uh, I just want to issue a quick reminder, please, uh, if you can access the notes, hopefully you can from the Kiko chat, uh, please remember to um, post your question in, in that notes document. Uh, some of you are, uh, it's great that some of you are also active in the Zoom as well, putting your stuff in the chat, but we're, we're trying our best to keep up with that and to migrate over to the Google Doc. So if you can try to do that as well, that'd be uh, fantastic. Thank you for your cooperation on that. And without further ado, uh, so Tamar, um, I believe you have a demo as well. Did you want to start with this first or? Oh, I, I don't have a demo, I just have my notes here. Okay, so, you just have your notes, okay. Yeah, it's all right if I... Feel free. Here. I can control the... Oh, my God. Then you would have to uh, zoom from here and share your screen. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on here. Okay, all right, I can... You just wanted to read your notes, right? Yeah, I just want to read my notes. No, that's fine. But I, yeah, you can just drive from there. Um, can I just leave put my notes up here? Yes.
Like, no, oh, they're only there. Oh, okay, okay. Let's see what we can do here. Can't move this too much, but. Let's put it on top like this, all right? Yeah. Cool. All right. <laughs> can everyone hear me okay? All right, sorry for the complications. Um, I'll be talking about uh, an ongoing project um, called the USGS State of the Data Project. Um, the goal is to assess the fairness of public USGS data products, that is how well they meet the fair criteria. Um, couple quick disclaimers. Um, I do wanna note that, wait, how do you? Um, we're, we're still in the middle of the project. We've completed the assessment, but our analyses and results haven't yet been finalized or shared with the broader community. So this is a presentation just about the project itself. Um, and uh, we're working on a more formal way to share the project results, hopefully later in August or September. Um, it's a very specific example, but hopefully relevant in the sense that um, it's an effort to quantify the fair characteristics for diverse collection data. And the lessons learned may be relevant to other projects. As well. Um, so a list of people who have contributed to the project. Um, special mention goes to Sophie Howe, who, um, especially during the first year of our two-year project, has really done a um, major portion of the work. Uh, and another important acknowledgement is we were able to build on existing rubrics and matrices that have already been created for FAIR and data maturity. Um, so I, I've listed them in the reference section here in the slides. All right, an overview. I'll start out with initial task, why it has its share of complications methodology, where we're at now, and some key takeaways. Uh, when we first sat down with um, the challenge of how, how to think about the state of the data, which is an absolutely enormous concept, um, a few things to consider. Uh, one is that USGS has a really wide variety of data types. So how do we find an evaluation technique to apply across the board? Um, there was also the question of how our assessments fit into uh, the resources that are already available in the USGS. Um, the data policies, review process, that sort of thing. And lastly, the scope was a really, really big topic of discussion. Um, uh, initially included the concept of analysis ready and data maturity, and that unfortunately ended up being a little bit too broad for um, what we were looking at. Okay, two-year project. Um, a pilot study, we looked at a sample set of, of data products evaluated against existing matrices. And during this stage, um, Sophie Howe also worked at a crosswalk of existing FAIR rubrics. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of really good resources out there that have already been created. Um, in the next stage, uh, more in-depth analysis and also more focused scope. So uh, we selected 400 data sets from the USGS metadata aggregator, which is called the Science Data Catalog. Um, so starting with the initial crosswalk table, we turned it into a list of binary questions that an assessor could evaluate. Um, yes, no, and in some cases not applicable. And many of the questions were customized for the USGS. So even though we were starting with uh, you know, a very general set of fair principles, we did have to um, make them more specific. We categorized the questions for our, for our purposes um, is essential, intermediate, and advanced. And it was a very iterative process. So, um, just a few images here, what the rubric currently looks like in a spreadsheet. Uh, we got some uh, an automatically populated scorecard here based on answers in the rubric. And there are four tabs. Um, this one is uh, the F tab. The questions are categorized by topic. And there's column for scoring guidance and what the assessor should look like, should look for in the metadata to answer certain questions. Okay. Um, I'm going to zoom through a few graphs because there's just like 10 minutes and I don't actually have time to get into details, but people can always ask me later if, if you're interested. Um, choosing a random USGS data release, uh, there's a, um, a screenshot in the landing page and citation. If you look at uh, the, the, four, um, the four letters of FAIR separately, the characteristics that were met were in blue, the ones that weren't in orange, and the gray is for NA. 
sorry for moving so fast. Um, if we divide that into, um, if we look at the essential and the intermediate and advanced, we'll see that that same data set meets most of the essential category, some of the intermediate and none advanced. Uh, lastly, for the graphs, I am zooming through. Um, we have something that looks at all the data sets in the assessment, um, checking out their normalized scores, again, for essential, intermediate, and advanced. And just preliminary, but I wanted to show some examples of how this could potentially be visualized. All right, going back to the process. Um, we had a methodology review, a workshop for USGS data managers, which helped us collect input and then um, learn about user perspectives. Calibration actually ended up big, being a, one of the biggest challenges because we had a like a, a group of data managers who worked um, on these assessments and making sure that the different assess, assessors were aligned in how they scored a data set was extremely challenging. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as uh, something that we, we had to devote more time to calibration than we had expected originally. Right, so where we're at now, um, currently analyzing data. I, um, and uh, we have plans to share the products of this project, first internally with USGS and then more broadly. And our next steps are how to apply the results. So this, we have some possibilities that we've thought about. Um, uh, one is um, it, this could inform updates to the USGS metadata tools. Uh, it could be relevant to USGS repositories, but also guidance directly for data authors. The group I work with is um, the Science Data Management Branch. And uh, we, we often share guidance and sometimes educational materials with data authors. Um, so the results here could inform um, what we focus on. And my last slide, do I have one minute left? Okay, a couple. couple of minutes, okay. Um, just to summarize some of the lessons learned, um, because again, it's an ongoing project, but we have learned a few things so far. Calibration is important, um, getting input, input from potential users early in the process. Um, there's a lot of customization, um, especially with a detailed scoring guide that we included, you know, for even if the same rubric was applied for different projects, th that scoring guide might look a little bit different. Um, existing fair matrices and guidelines were extremely helpful. And, and lastly, um, taking like a really high level view of this project, uh, it highlighted for us how applicable um, and relevant the fair principles were for USGS. Um, and uh, I, th I think that this will be even more clear once we start applying the results. So that's it for me. That, that would make sense. Sorry guys. It's not shared right now. I thought I just shared it, dude. Okay. Let's make this full screen. Okay, full screen. No, we gotta we gotta share screen too, because that's what's up there. Okay, so our next talk is by Dr. Robert Huber, a researcher with the Penn J Group, who has also a pre-recorded presentation for us as uh, Dr. Huber could not be with us today. So we will go ahead and play this. Just give me one moment. I have to reload it. Man, that's so 
That's so weird. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce you to our concept of the implementation of fair assessment of research data objects used in the future. The work I present today was carried out in the context of the FAIR SPARE project and is now continued in the FAIR IMPACT project. The goal was to uh, pilot the FAIR assessment of research data from trusted data repositories. Here we were focusing on research data, data which is observed, collected, and measured for scientific purposes. To achieve the goal of this task, we implemented two important components assessment metrics and practical tools as tests to perform the FAIR assessment based on these metrics. Those components are addressed priority and innovation of the 2030 reality report published by the European Commission. Generally, we follow the use case based approach to uh, scope our task for a fair assessment. And therefore, we identified uh, and explored eight different scenarios for assessment, which can be performed at different stages of the research data lifecycle as shown here. And each of these uh, stages are, of course, involving different stakeholders and actors. Out of these eight scenarios, uh, we choose the two scenarios as priority use cases. One use case is about raising awareness of researchers for FAIR before they did process their data in an appropriate data archive. And the, and the tool we developed here is called FAIR Aware. Uh, the other uh, one is uh, assessment of research data, which already is archived in trusted data archives, to evaluate their readiness for reuse, basically. Here we developed Fuji to perform these assessments, and this is the tool which I'm going to show uh, in detail in this talk. The metrics we specified to perform the practical assessment were defined based on prior work performed during the FAIR done and FAIR enough projects. And of course, we're aligned with the RDA data maturity model, as well as the Euro data system RDA data fitness for use change. In an iterative process, which uh, involved several stakeholders, such as data publishers, international initiatives such as OGC, RDA, RDS, as well as the EOS, uh, the European Open Science Cloud Fair Working Group, we have defined 17 metrics, which uh, have been available for public comments, and uh, I think they still are available for, for comments. So if you uh, want to comment it, uh, please visit the website at fairspare.e. Based on these uh, fair square metrics, we have then defined several practical tests which can be implemented by an automated assessment tool. The approach here is hierarchical, which means each fair principle can have one or more metrics. And for each metric, we define one or more practical tests. Practical test design is best, uh, based on uh, several community best practices and standards, such as the recommendations on data citation and data description from force level or some um, uh, worldwide web consortium groups. Uh, for a complete list of these just test justifications, please take a look at the delivery form on five, which is available at C1. So here illustrated is uh, the uh, practical tests uh, for the uh, metric FSF F102D, and here uh, the metric is about assigning a persistent or the identification of persistent identifiers. And the practical test would then be, for example, uh, to check if the identifier is based on a distinct uh, persistent identification scheme or filters. And the second test would be if this identifier can be used. We have implemented all metrics and associated tests for the Fuji team, uh, which is available as open source software on GitHub. Some more information on the tool you can find also on the Fuji homepage, which is available at f-fuji.net. Um, <clears throat> some remark on the, the acronym, the name Fuji. Fuji is Malaysian and uh, means test. And F, of course, means uh, fair. And we have uh, chosen the minus uh, just to avoid uh, confusion with the uh, Fuji company. Fuji actually is a web service. Its REST API is based on the Open API specification and was implemented in Python using Swagger. This example here on the right side shows how an output of our Fuji looks like. The response is given in JSON format and includes uh, information about, for example, the state of the test, its 
score which was reached, then the output further specifies what the uh, gene could identify in the big data or data which justifies the results of the test. Fuji further includes very verbose and pickup messages which can be used to reproduce the overall test flow. The rest of the ID is also some information in the HDR. This chart is summarizing the high level flow of the Fuji assessment. Fuji is taking a PID or UMI as different parameters to perform the assessment. So, this is the, the starting point for each their assessment. Optionally, an open archives initiatives uh, or catalog uh, for the web or sporting interface and what can be given. Fuji is then trying to identify metadata, which is given on the landing page, for example, and is also uh, utilizing other methods uh, explained in the next slide to uh, gather uh, metadata. Uh, Fuji is further using, for example, this uh, open access initiative uh, interface in Gaza to identify if a specific metadata is provided and uh, to identify which other metadata standards are supported. It is also using uh, additional third party services such as uh, re free data and uh, API to get more information about the data provider and its uh, <coughs> capabilities in general. So this shows how uh, metadata information grows in detail. So Fuji is uh, taking uh, in the first place, I was the slide before, uh, metadata which is given on the landing page. Uh, this can be embedded uh, in W4, for example, or embedded in JSON-LD, or the FA, or microdata formats. And in addition to this, uh, Fuji is trying to identify type links in the header section as well as in the uh, uh, response header of the uh, HTTP request uh, following the signposting uh, <coughs> recommendations. And which is following by this text to, to retrieve additional metadata. Which is additionally uh, performing content negotiation uh, in order to retrieve metadata in alternative formats, for example, TXML, uh, JSON, or RDF. Uh, above is a list of um, metadata standards which are uh, presently supported by Fuji, for example, domain agnostic standards like Tangle Core, or Schema for Dataset, DataSide, or DCAD2. Uh, in addition, uh, Fuji is uh, also able to extract metadata from uh, structured data, or the air, or uh, terminal, and so on. And uh, Fuji is also now <coughs> starting to implement uh, domain specific metadata formats uh, such as the I code book or ISO 1950 uh, or EMI. This is an ongoing process which uh, well, will uh, grow the number of supported metadata standards. In addition to the API and REST interface I showed before, we have also uh, implemented now a uh, a web-based graphical user interface which allows interested users to perform and analyze uh, the fair tests uh, with Fuji in a human-friendly way without knowledge of uh, API usage and JSON. Uh, the output of this tool includes uh, full test reports uh, which includes, uh, for example, the debug messages and uh, all the other uh, items I mentioned before. It also has a graphical overview of the uh, reach uh, the test result in terms of the percentage for and so on. This uh, uh, tool can be found on F minus Fuji. Fuji was designed to improve the fairness of data data sets. We therefore applied our metrics on how to trust the higher repositories. From each of these repositories, about uh, 500 data sets have been assessed. Uh, and here we used uh, an earlier version of our metrics as an early version of Fuji. Each pilot assessment was performed in combination with an in-depth face-to-face consulting process. We additionally manually checked selected datasets from each repository in order to verify future results, as well as to identify the potential improvements for each repository. These improvement suggestions uh, were summarized in an assessment report as shown here. Such as the report contains uh, comments and the recommendation for next steps uh, for each metric. 
for example, here we suggested to uh, <coughs> well, improve the way how access levels uh, can be expressed in metadata using schema protocol. These uh, assessment reports were discussed with data providers. Uh, in most cases, they took the opportunity to improve the fairness of the assets. To verify these improvements, we ran the assessment a second time. So this is showing the results of uh, the first and the second test, for example, uh, for the Pangea repository where I work for, and uh, the combination of the automated assessment and the face-to-face -face share consulting really resulted in almost all cases with significant improvements of the overall fair level. So you can, uh, for example, see here that the uh, accessibility improved uh, after the, the first consulting round uh, significantly from uh, 0 to 100% and also uh, slight improvements can be noticed uh, regarding the reusability of uh, data and uh, <coughs> also yeah, for the other uh, principles. Post had muted this or something. I wonder if it was just the microphone versus the, the audio from the computer. You just need to try it once more. Okay. So let's check. Yes. So to summarize what uh, we learned here during this uh, exercise uh, of the fair assessment, uh, first of all, uh, I think we can show that automatized fair assessment of research data actually is possible. And we could also show that we are able to support a very large database of the community. So the five islands came from uh, social sciences, natural sciences, and so on. So this is uh, very diverse. Uh, in addition to these uh, pilots I uh, presented in the slide for, uh, before, we uh, also performed uh, assessment on the uh, holdings of Chester, IBS Nordic, and DTVS NL, and some other uh, research uh, data archives, uh, which also proved the usability or uh, well, <coughs> usefulness of uh, Fuji for these communities. Uh, yeah, so another lesson we learned is that uh, uh, all these uh, assessments led to uh, mutual improvement. So it was not only uh, the data which uh, improved fairness, but we also put, uh, improved the, the, the tool Fuji because uh, every implementation of fairness, of course, is slightly different from, from data archive to data archive. And this improvement is an ongoing process. In summary, I think uh, the best uh, use for uh, for Fuji is that uh, Fuji either is used uh, in combination with a face-to-face -face, uh, fair consulting process in order to, well, actually lead to uh, mutual improvement. Thank
So while we load the next slide, I'll just introduce our next speaker, uh, Aaron Kalpas, uh from the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. And I believe, Aaron, you're the one with the demo, correct? Yes, but it's in the slides. So okay. Over here. Okay. Just go over yours. Oh. Okay, let me just do this. Thanks. Yeah, so I think watching that previous presentation, the uh, the tool that we're going to show here, uh, really looking at the uh, quality of metadata is pretty complementary to what was just shown. So uh, first off, I want to say that this is uh, me presenting, but it's uh, part of a larger effort by the ARC team within the IMPACT uh, project at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center uh, to do metadata quality assessments. Uh, so before actually diving into the tool, let's see if we can advance. Uh, I want to give a brief introduction of kind of where this uh, evolved from. Uh, so I mentioned the ARC project. Uh, the ARC project stands for the analysis and review of CMR. It was established to assess and improve uh, EOS this metadata quality. Uh, so really they were, the goal was to identify and define the quality and then perform a detailed assessment on EOS disk collections in the CMR with the outcome of hopefully having more complete and consistent metadata, improved data discoverability, accessibility, and usability, and also improved documentation and communication around best practices for metadata curation. Uh, so this is very much a collaboration between the ARC team, DAX, and ESDIS to um, understand schemas and best practices, develop those best practices, and then assess and communicate uh, the results of this assessment back to the DAX for improvement. Uh, so this is a very high level process diagram, but you can see uh, that for CMR, uh, or for the process, we're fundamentally pulling metadata out of the CMR. The ARC team does their assessment and communicates this back to the DAX, where based on uh, the assessment, they devise a strategy and timeline, work through the findings, and then republish their metadata. And this is an ongoing process. Uh, so as community schemas, and standards evolve, then this process will continue uh, and the evaluation will continue. So in order to actually help support this, uh, the ARC team has put a lot of effort into coming up with this uh, priority matrix to systematically assess the metadata. Um, it has a strong emphasis on correctness, completeness, and consistency of the metadata. And there's really four different categories going from green, color-coded, no issues, everything's good with the, the entry, the lower priority findings, such as there's minor inconsistencies in the metadata, all the way to these high priority findings, such as you know URLs being broken or pointing to the wrong types of information. So those are things that really want to focus and have an emphasis on correcting. Um, but that framework has really uh, led to development of this Python package called PyCork, uh, which is just quality assessment of uh, uh, CMR. So this is a open source Python library for the Earth uh, observation metadata quality assessment. And really the goal here was to take that framework, implement it into an automated tool that could then be used within the evaluation process and really uh, free up the human evaluators to make more sophisticated assessments of the metadata. So going from, you know, just is there an abstract in the metadata to, you know, does the abstract contain useful information for the users? Um, so even beyond that, uh, oh, sorry. So the, the PyCork framework is, is really pretty simple. It's um, uh, really a set of four or three JSON files. There's this checks.json that holds the data type and the actual uh, functions that would be applied to the particular metadata field. There's a messages JSON that contains the failures and any remediation messages. So that's really going back and pulling upon that priority matrix framework. And then there's a rules JSON file, which includes the fields to apply as well as the severity index. So whether or not it's a minor, minor issue or a major one. And really part of the power of, of having this open source package is that um, users could adopt this for their own particular needs. They could go and download this entire framework and modify these JSON files uh, to suit the, the validations that they're wishing to perform. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through this really whole flow diagram, but I would, kind of wanted to point out, you know, how data flows throughout this Py, uh, Python package. Um, so at the top is really those inputs. Those are those JSON files that are really 
uh, developed prior to actually executing the, the uh, function itself. There's a simple main.py Python function that executes this checker. And there's also a scheduler that's a part of this that ensures that the checks are performed in the correct order and that dependencies are captured. So for example, you wanna make sure that your date time is in the correct format before trying to do any like um, checks to see if the ranges applied for those are correct. And then there's uh, in addition the validator that actually performs and executes the check functions, uh, feeds the tracker, which just goes through the entire check process and then outputs the information to the screen. Uh, so this is just a high level look at the output of that. Uh, so if you were to run this on your local machine, you could see um, the file that it was run on, the actual field that was checked, and whether or not there was an error in the remediation. So all of those different components of that JSON file are output to the screen for, for the user. So this is great. Uh, it's nice to run locally, but uh, how do you get this out into the community and really uh, uh, help get it in use, but also get uh, feedback from the community as, as schemas evolved? And this is where uh, PyCork as a service comes into play. So this was taking that Python package, deploying it to Amazon Web Services, and making it available through an API to users. Uh, so there's a pretty simple architecture diagram. Uh, you have uh, PyCork and a Lambda later, and this is updated from a GitHub repository once a day. So as um, changes are being made either to PyCork or to the checks, they could be uploaded to that GitHub and automatically incorporated. There's a Lambda function that actually runs the metadata itself, uh, metadata checks itself, and then there's an API to interact um, with the package. And so this has actually been deployed, and I think the next slide Hopefully it works. We'll actually go through a short demonstration, but you can see that we have this released as a, a uh, beta application that any user can go through and utilize. Um, there's just a simple validate API. So to get people started, there's just a default um, collection that can be utilized. Uh, this is calling on the operational CMR. Uh, so to try it out to start with, you don't have to do anything. You can just hit try and see what the output is. Um, Oh, did it pause? There we go. Uh, there's also support within uh, PyCork for uh, various um, metadata schemas. So what was just shown on the screen was switching from Echo 10 to a UMM uh, JSON schema. And once you hit execute, you see below uh, an output as a JSON format, again, with all of the metadata fields that were checked, the various error messages, and uh, the remediation for those messages. And then the final component to this, uh, we'll let this go scroll to the bottom, is it actually summarizes everything for you. So if you wanted to just skip down to the end, uh, see how things are going, oh, keeps pausing for some reason. Um, it'll actually show the total number of errors that are associated with that metadata file and also all the different fields for which uh, errors were noted. So I'll let that play through. Um, and then there it is. So there's the total number of errors, total number of good, file, uh, good fields, and then all of the various uh, fields that were executed that it identified any issues. Uh, the final thing I wanted to point out, and I'll just let this continue to play, um, in addition to calling on the operational CMR, you can actually upload uh, files from your local machine to this API and have it run those same checks. So it's not just calling uh, a repository. Um, so again, that goes back to that uh, really uh, high level functionality. If you wanted to create your own checks, run this as your own service, you could then have your own um, metadata files to upload and, and do those checks upon. And then uh, finally, it is released as a beta. We're actually still adding some functionality to it. Uh, one thing being uh, the ability to call on uh, various, uh, various metadata repositories. So not just uh, the operational CMR for NASA, but you could potentially call upon any, any repository. Um, 
so one minute. So I'm going to go to the final slide just to conclude. Uh, so putting on a little bit of different hats, um, working uh, alongside the ARC team, but on the commercial small set data acquisition program, we're actually able to kind of become early adopters for, for this uh, service. And we begin implementing this uh, in two different factions, one and the data publication step. Uh, so we are publishing data to the NASA uh, CMR, and in doing so, you know, we're running these set of checks prior to any publication, so uh, our metadata can be as complete and consistent as possible. But then also in this long-term monitoring phase, so uh, as we know, over time, metadata can sometimes um, maybe unexpectedly degrade or change, and we want to help catch that and hopefully resolve those errors before we get back to, say, the ARC team. Uh, so we've implemented it uh, in both of these steps. Uh, we also have a simple interface uh, that basically provides an output similar to what uh, that priority matrix looks like, where we see uh, blue, uh, yellow, red uh, corresponding to the errors and uh, the remediations along with those. Uh, so with that, I think I'm out of time. So I'll pause and turn it back over to the conveners. <laughs> And if I could invite uh, Peng to the podium as well, because we're going to be transitioning to the Q&A. Just doing a time check, I believe we only have 11 minutes left in the allotted time, so this will probably have to be a really quick one. I think the first thing we're going to we're going to go ahead and do is take questions from the audience. So whether you entered a question in the Google Doc directly, or if you just want to ask your question out loud, we do have a microphone in the room that we can use. So I've actually got a question for Aaron. <laughs> um, so I, I, li I like I love the technology, um, uh, Py PyQuark, um, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, and I, I love how it does all the error checking. As you know, uh, the MMT tool in CMR also kind of has built-in error checking in it as well. How is this different from that? And, and is there any plan to maybe incorporate, um, maybe bridge some of those difference, those differences and incorporate some of that capability into MMT directly? Yeah, so I'm going to let uh, Janae also chime in if she, if she has any input on this, but uh, really the CMR uh, and the MMT tool does a lot of uh, validation checks around um, not necessarily the content, but whether the schema is actually met. So you can put in a title or an abstract and it would show up, hey, you've got it here, it's, it's entered, but that doesn't mean the content there is actually good or useful to the end users. Uh, so the content curation and, and the quality that the, the ARC team is really put together is doing those type checks. Uh, so PyQuark uh, complements, and I think a lot of this, this automation goes to potentially schemas over time, because um, as you know, once you publish metadata to CMR, uh, the schemas may update, but that doesn't mean it's actually backfilled to all of the previously published metadata. So it can catch some of those type errors. Um, but yeah, I, I think there, there's still, difficulties in, in getting the quality and making sure the quality is is updated over time and PyCorp can potentially contribute to that. And are there any questions on on the remote side that we can take? So there's no questions on the remote participation. Um, I can. I extend the question that you were asking. I was about to ask a similar question of Aaron. Uh, the question is, um, is, I was going to ask, is this project adopting PyQuark for uh, examining metadata that are being created for newly developed products? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. I was uh, saying for, uh, is, is this project adopting PyQuark for examining metadata that come in with newly developed and submitted products? I uh, certainly could be using that framework and uh, I'm not gonna speak to everything that ARC is doing as far as new data products, but that is where CSDA is going with it. 
Uh, as part of our publication step, we're running these checks and doing our consistency prior to pushing anything to the operational CMR. So it could be used in that sense, yes. And that could be adopted by the community. So that, that's, we're not the only ones that has to go that route. Uh, it's an open Python package, open API. So any, any users could go through, run their metadata through it prior to any data, formal data publication. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that question, Rama. So we have a few minutes. Okay, one, one question in the room. And we have a microphone available. Yeah. And please, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself as well before you ask your question. Right over there. Hi, I'm Stace uh, from Woods Hole Oceanographic. I have a question for Tamar. Norkin? Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Great. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, because you are you are using um, heterogeneous data sets. You, you had a bunch of different types of data that you're looking at. And I'm wondering, um, can you summarize, like, what did you have to customize? Like, what was different about your data sets that made you um, have to make something new in your matrix? Oh, that's, that's a good question. I could go in many directions. Um, I, I think that one of the things that we had to, um, one, one of the angles that we had to look at was um, how this fits into existing resources that are already available in USGS. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at products that are already published and in the USGS they would be standardized to a certain extent, but still have a lot of variation in them, in, in that um, uh, the metadata and data have already been through the review and approval process. And um, we do have a, a, ch a check that runs on the metadata to check that the standard fields are there. And if they have gone through that process, um, you know, they, they, they will be standardized to a certain extent. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, we, we were looking at data from multiple repositories. Um, you know, we have this, uh, um, a, a, data, a metadata aggregator at the USGS that pulls uh, metadata from many, many different, like, like if it's published in the USGS, it should have metadata filed there. Um, it's not completely comprehensive, but it should be. Um, so we're looking at different data types and there are a lot of, uh, you know, like fairness um, characteristics can vary depending on what, what, what the data are. Um, so in that sense, we had to keep certain things very general, but at the same time, very specific for the USGS, if that makes sense. Can I be more specific about something or <laughs> does that help answer? Hold on to your mic. Uh, oh, there are sure. a couple of questions. I have one in the um, meeting note, but just for the sake of people online, and I'm going to ask you about the, how do you address the evaluation of the FAIR um, vocabulary, and the Leslie has a follow-on questions. So I'll let you answer that question for online attendees. Um, is it specifically for me? Yes. Okay. That's how do you address the uh, evaluation of the fair vocabulary in your matrix? Um, what, one of one of our, our big topics of discussion is how how in depth we go in in, in terms of. Um, looking at like like specific elements of, of fair like for example um uh you know are all of the keywords in the metadata uh, matched up to a, a thesaurus um and so because of the fact that we ended up being pretty high level um we just asked you know like an essential category would be um are there keywords in the metadata and then an intermediate one or like next level would be are they from uh, an authoritative source like the us just the source okay. so leslie has a follow-on um, question i think that's going to be the last one and she said i too in the fair principles require vocabulary to also be machine actionable yes are those keywords available online and machine actionable um yeah excellent question um so one of the one of the things that we checked for in the, the USGS metadata is um, whether or not the, the information we're looking for is in a specific field um, in the XML. Um, so, and we would only count it if it was there in the metadata. Um, and uh, also if it was from an authoritative source, that would be listed um, in that field as well, like what it what was pulled from. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, David, for facilitating. You, you want to, yeah. 
Yes, thank you for participating in the Q&A. So without further ado, we have um, five minutes left. I'm gonna go ahead and invite our, our brand new chair of the Information Quality Cluster, Zhang Lu, uh, to come up and say a few words. Zhang, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so excited, but uh, I think the recession is uh, coming up very soon. So, I'm <laughs> okay. First, I would like to thank the session organizers, uh, Peng, Bob, Lama, David, Yaxing, and the information uh, quality cluster. A big shout out to Peng, who did a, a lot of work to prepare for the session. I would also like to thank uh, today's uh, speakers and uh, the audience for their great uh, presentations and uh, uh, particip participations. I would also like to thank the ESIP for providing the platform uh, to engage the community. I would also like to thank uh, Yasin for his leadership in the cluster. It does take a lot of effort, time and energy to work on the data quality challenges. And uh, it is a truly a community effort to solve the data quality problems. And then we need you to participation and uh, collaboration. So how to get involved? And uh, you can sign up for our monthly telecom, uh, attend our annual uh, ESIP meetings and uh, the AGU for meeting informatics uh, section on data quality. I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. I hope to see you soon. <laughs>